Okay, uh, so very happy to have Hugo Vincent uh, give us the uh, invited talk today. Hugo is a principal research engineer at uh, ARM in Cambridge, and his research has been spanning both the hardware and the software. He's worked on uh, both the processors and uh, the software through the embed uh, library. And uh, I think he should have uh, a pretty interesting take on secure compilation. So thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and uh, this is my first time at Presk, and in fact, my first popple as well. So um, very excited to be here and uh, go easy on me, please. <laughs> um, all right, so as um, Jonathan introduced, I'm um, part of ARM Research. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure most people here know who ARM are. Um, we are design primarily uh, compute technology and CPUs. Um, and I'm part of ARM Research, which is an organization of about 180 researchers um, based in Cambridge in the UK and Austin, Texas, and a few other sites around the world. Um, I'm part of the systems group and I lead the security uh, efforts in uh, ARM Research. Um, so the talk I'm giving today is um, uh, basically some perspectives on uh, trends and things that I think are interesting in secure compilation and some of the work we're doing in the space um, and kind of sort of around the space. Um, so yeah, to get started, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about some sort of macro trends to frame things and um, hopefully none of these are going to come as a huge surprise to anyone, but I think it's, it's useful just to sort of set the context of it by running through them uh, quickly. So. One thing that uh, those of us in the hardware industry are talking a lot about these days and for the last couple of years is um, the fact that uh, manufacturing technology, chip manufacturing technology, uh, progress is slowing and this is called, called the end of Moore's law. And the free ride that, um, and I use that, that phrase in air quotes, the free ride that the industry had for 20 or 30 years, um, sort of starting uh, around the early 90s was um, you know, every 18 months, transistors got smaller, faster, lower power and cheaper. And that is no longer the reality. Um, there's still progress being made, um, but it's typically, you know, pick any two, or maybe if you're lucky, pick any three of those uh, four uh, desirable traits. So um, the result of that is that uh, there's an increasing prevalence of hardware acceleration for a wider range of tasks. If you look at um, especially a, a mobile um, SOC, like in a smartphone, that's kind of our, our bread and butter at ARM. Um, if you look at a die shop for one of them, um, you know, increasingly the CPUs are kind of just a little dot in the corner and there's a whole sea of all sorts of other hardware accelerators, you know, GPUs, neural network accelerators uh, and all sorts of other things. Um, within the CPU and kind of in the, in the world of, of kind of like traditional software, there's an increasing role of architecture um, and and increasing responsibility for software on optimization rather than sort of the, the brute force approaches or, or ex expensive abstractions uh, to hide problems. And the, the last kind of macro trend is that security by most measures is, is getting worse. Um, and this kind of confluence of all of these trends is, is the challenge that we're facing. And that's where I think the, the role of secure compilation is becoming incredibly important. So thinking of compilation abstractly, you know, lowering and mapping of programmer intent to executable execution hardware, the job of a compiler is, is getting much harder, right? There's more pressure on performance um, by the, the slowing of Moore's law um, and, and the, uh, you know, the, the lack of, of increasing frequencies and increasing IPC that, that have been the norm for many years. Um, and at the same time as that, you, you know, there are larger instruction set architectures with more sophisticated features. Um, the, the ARM architecture reference uh, manual is something like eight and a half thousand pages at this point. So there's a lot of stuff at that hardware software interface that the compiler has to know about just the, the CPU. And then you've got all of that other uh, range of diverse execution resource I mentioned. And, you know, I guess we traditionally don't think of a compiler um, as targeting all of that at once, target, targeting that sort of heterogeneous set of, of execution resource, but 
abstractly that is kind of in the in the realm of a compiler's job um and then on top of all of that there's a much you know much longer and increasingly long list of security concerns that um the compiler is either kind of complicit in or has to um, take responsibility for addressing um so and then on top of all of those you know if you if you hang around in a, in a hardware company or, or go to a hardware industry conference or something like that you often hear people saying phrases like oh that's just a software problem right um and i think the last couple of years you know since um when was it 2017 um it's been really interesting being in that world um, as Spectre and all of the sort of deluge of related microarchitectural side channel attacks um, have have come uh, out. And I think this has highlighted the need for uh, cooperation and collaboration between hardware and software communities. And if you think about it, you know, the the hardware software divide, what sits on either side of that, one side is the compiler and one side is the ISA, right? Um, and uh that's why we at arm and arm research are really really interested in this uh this domain of secure compilation um many research uh, sorry many security mechanisms have a significant performance cost um i'm talking about both software and hardware security mechanisms here um and in many cases this is due to conservative assumptions right you kind of uh, as a as an architect or as a developer you think what's the worst case here? And you, you sort of um, bake that in as a conservative assumption. And now that's a safe thing to do, but with those headwinds I mentioned on the previous slide um, around performance pressure, um, we are being forced to revisit some of those assumptions, right? Um, so putting all that together, secure compilation promises a way forward, um, you know, abstractly allowing programmers to specify security intent at the programming language level um, and having the compilation technology automatically exploit new hardware security features that the hardware is exposed and um, you know verifiably um, map software onto hardware using um, specifications requirements and variants and so forth exported by the hardware um, this is this is kind of the um, Holy Grail, I guess, if you if you want to look at it that way, and I'll come I'll come back to that um, towards the end. Um, so those are some of the trends to kind of frame things. Um, I want to give a, a couple of motivating applications and use cases um, for why, uh, from an ARM perspective, um, secure compilation is important, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some recent investigations we've been doing in the research group. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so motivations. So the first one I'm going to talk about is confidential compute. And this is uh, kind of a, a, a buzzword that's starting to, to show up all over the place in, uh, over the last sort of 12 months or so. Um, confidential compute is about securing data in use. And this, uh, this is in contrast to kind of two of the traditional notions we think about in terms of security, which is securing data in transit and securing data at rest. So securing data in transit is a fairly well understood problem, you know, by no means easy, but fairly well understood. And things like crypto protocols, um, such as TLS are kind of the, the tools in the toolbox. Um, likewise, securing data at rest is, is fairly well understood. You know, we, we uh, things like encrypted storage and databases and verified boot and that sort of thing are relatively well understood. Securing data in use is in general, not uh, so well understood or not so universally understood. Um, it is counterintuitive, right? How do you operate on data while keeping it in a, for example, crypt, uh, encrypted form? Um, there are cryptographic uh, approaches that exist, right? Like fully homomorphic encryption, but these are severely limiting um, either in computation model or in performance. There are some, uh, there's a lot of momentum building around trusted hardware and, and, and trusted execution environments as a way of, of achieving uh, you know, data security and use and delivering confidential compute. And this in a way is kind of building on some of the kind of constrained applications that have enabled this technology that are now widespread, such as DRM for protecting media. Um, as I say, this is kind of a buzzword that's been gaining uh, momentum quite rapidly over the last year. Um, this was an article in Spectrum uh, last May 
saying a handful of major technology companies are going all in on this new security model called confidential compute. Arm is one of those companies. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is through our participation in the Confidential Compute Consortium, which is a Linux Foundation project um, with quite a wide range of member companies, including um, both Arm and Intel, and uh, which I guess represent um, the most uh, common computer architectures and then uh, a number of, uh, of the major cloud vendors and um, other hardware and software vendors. Um, and this is uh, focusing on securing data in use and accelerating the adoption of confidential compute openly. It's an open source uh, project, as you would imagine, under the Linux Foundation. Um, so why is this why is this kind of hyping? Um, it is a very powerful thing. The capability of doing confidential compute enables computation on sensitive data um, on machines you don't control or trust. So you can offload compute um, to the cloud, to the edge, to other people's computers without um, allowing them to, to have, you know, carte blanche access to that data. And there's a whole lot of reasons why that's a good idea, you know, from the kind of regulatory like GDPR and HIPAA compliance um, uh, to, you know, increasing need for things like cybersecurity and cyber breach insurance and the requirements that insurance is posing. Um, through to kind of increased commercial and consumer awareness of the value of data, the sensitivity of data, um, and, you know, maybe a little bit more utopian, um, sort of the desire to empower privacy sensitive users uh, and applications to benefit from all of this progress that's been made over the last sort of decade or so in cloud and edge and distributed architectures. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I don't want to sort of, I'm trying not to overhype this, but um, confidential compute promises to finally unlock the full version of sort of distributed compute as a utility or kind of grid computing as it's often called. And I think that's pretty exciting. There are two main ways of doing confidential compute. Um, and both of these are deeply reliant on secure compilation in rather different ways. And I'll, I'll talk more about both of these ways uh, later on. So the first way, as, as I touched on earlier, is, is cryptographic approaches. Um, canonically fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and these are great because, you know, the security properties of, of crypto are fairly, um, fairly well understood and fairly, uh, you know, you can write them down and communicate them quite easily. Um, and you, you know, you just have to trust the maths. And once you trust the maths, then you can put the computation anywhere and you don't have to figure out whether or how to trust it. Um, the current state of the art in fully homomorphic encryption has a number of downsides. Um, most pressingly, I guess, is, is performance, which um, is typically around 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 times slower than native code. Uh, and in fact, it can, it can even be more than that, depending on what the code's doing. Um, and the other sort of major downside is the computational model is, is quite restricted, and, and we'll come back to that later on. The other approach, the one that's kind of gaining momentum a lot at the moment is trusted hardware. And this is kind of a compromise. This is not as, um, idea, uh, you know, it's not as philosophically a thing as, as the cryptographic approach, but it's a bit more pragmatic. And the, the idea is to use jointly trusted hardware um, locked down under jointly agreed upon conditions. And the way this is done is through um, kind of three bits of technology. One is trusted execution environments, um, which are, um, hardware backed sort of isolation mechanisms um, within a larger system. Um, the second is remote attestation, which allows the remote party, the relying party, so I guess Alice in the case of these diagrams, to um, uh, strongly, um, to, to gain strong assurance of the state and the contents of the trusted execution environment on the, on the remote party, on Bob's computer in this case. Um, and then the third one is sandboxing technologies. And this is about um, protecting Bob's computer from potentially a malicious program um, by Alice in this case. Um, so using these types of approaches, the trusted computing base can be greatly reduced, but you, you know, the reason I say it's a pragmatic compromise is there's still, um, all parties still have to trust the correctness um, 
of the underlying hardware and the low level sort of software and firmware that makes this possible. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, would be nice to have, but doesn't exist and most probably will never exist is a way of kind of hashing physical material, right? Like you can't, you know, there's nothing analogous to a cryptographic hash function for the physical processor chip that you're running on, right? Um, and so there's, there's, there's a degree of trust involved. Um, okay, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a motivation for secure compilation is cryptographic software. And we've heard a lot about that earlier this afternoon and the other press talks. Um, Cryptography is just such an important thing, right? It's how we establish trust and distributed systems and on the internet. And I think, you know, the last 12 months with um, many of us being forced to work from home has kind of highlighted the importance of that um, more than ever. Another, you know, another one that's, another reason cryptographic software is important and worth protecting is, um, uh, I, I was actually just looking at the, uh, I was reading a news story about Bitcoin the other day and I was staggered to see um, how much that's increased in value in recent times. And uh, the chart uh, on the slide here shows the, um, you know, the total volume of all Bitcoin in circulation at the current price and how that's uh, evolved over time from 2013 to the present. Um, the market capitalization is now around 700 billion US dollars, which is quite a lot of money. And if you're a if you're an attacker and you think that some of the software, right, because software implements this, some of the software that implements this uh, this cryptocurrency might be vulnerable to attack, and you're willing to um, either be criminal or unethical about it, then there's an awful lot of money to be made here. So. Um, uh, Cryptocurrencies are a good reason to care about uh, secure compilation of software. The next motivating thing I want to talk about was system software. And, you know, in, in communities like this, I think we often talk about privileged software, um, OS kernels, hypervisors, debuggers, that sort of thing. Um, I think the reason those are important is self evident. I wanted to talk about some of the others that I don't see talked about so often. Um, the first one here is firmware and early boot software. And this software, like privileged software, right, is incredibly high privilege. It happens first thing out of boot, out of reset on the hardware. Um, and it typically has all of the capability, all of the privilege that exists in the system. And it's responsible for configuring the hardware correctly, working around silicon bugs by, dis by disabling faulty hardware. These are so-called chicken bits and then bootstrapping into nicer software. And this is, this is super high privilege and super important because everything that happens after it and the chain of trust relies on it, but it's often pretty hacky and, and under-documented code, especially um, the code that works around hardware faults, which are often um, not publicly documented at all. So that would be an opportunity for improving things. Um, the next one is, performance governors and controllers. Um, these have started to make their way into the security literature over the last few years through things like um, the clock screw and Thunderbolt attacks. Um, so these are bits of uh, software that are responsible for managing clock and power and thermals in a chip. And it is now the case that pretty much any um, CPU chip, whether it's in a mobile or a desktop or a server, is having to actively manage clock and power and thermals. Um, so there is software that runs that has the potential to, to permanently damage the hardware it's running on. And there's the potential for hardware to betray the software by, for example, um, breaking abstractions um, or allowing, um, allowing uh, maluse to, to, to inject um, faults into software or to introduce side channels. Um, so that's another really interesting uh, thing that would benefit from secure compilation. And then the, the last one on here is kind of firmware for non-CPU hardware. Um, I talked about in the macro trends at the start, the, um, the increasing heterogeneity and diversity of all of the, the stuff on a chip. Um, and all of those things that aren't the CPU are increasingly self-contained and smart, and most of them run their own firmware. Most of them can generate memory transactions that bypass most of the software protections that exist and even the highest privileged software like the hypervisor on the main CPU. 
And, you know, some system level defenses do exist, such as IOMMUs and, and, a, and a bunch of other related things, but often these are underutilized in current system. Okay, so in, in terms of, uh, so that sort of wraps up the, the motivations I want to talk about. The next part is about um, some of the things that we're doing um, that I thought might be interesting to this community. So the first one, um, just very briefly, is on hardware capability architecture. Um, and this is um, trying to attack the problem of uh, memory unsafety. Um, memory, memory safety remain um, the dominant source of security bugs. Um, they are primarily due to the fact that a lot of software is written in C and C++ and C and C++ memory safety is a mess. So two bits of data here, one from um, Google uh, in 2018, um, basically saying more than 50% of high and critical severity bugs in Chrome and Android are, you know, have a root cause of memory safety. Um, more recently, I, I just pulled this quote from the Chromium um, website, the Chromium project finds that around 70% of our serious security bugs are memory safety problems. And likewise at, at Microsoft, um, Matt Miller gave a talk in early 2019 and um, Matt's in their security response center at Microsoft. Um, and the chart here, it, it's probably a little bit small, but the chart is basically um, a categorization of all of the CVEs um, that Microsoft have patched from, uh, I think from 2006 to 2018. And the dark blue is memory safety related and the light blue is non-memory safety related. And you can see over that period from all the way back to 2006, there's a remarkably stable kind of 70% of vulnerabilities are, are kind of on average um, stemming from memory safety. So this is a mess and it's kind of been a mess for a long time. Um, as, uh, as ARM, we've, we've tried to address this in a few, a few different ways. Um, in, in recent versions of the architecture, we've added a few features um, that help um, patch some types of memory safety issues. So um, we've introduced things like um, pointer authentication codes in I think um, ARM v8.3 and um, a memory tagging extension and I think it was in ARM v8.5. Um, those are good and you know those will eventually I presume show up in, in devices like phones and so forth and hopefully help but we were interested in um, seeing if there was a way of attacking that problem more at the root cause. And um, to that end, we've been working with um, the Cherry Project, which is a, uh, a development of the University of Cambridge and SRI that they've been working on since about 2010. And we've been working with them uh, since about 2016, I think. Um, the, uh, so Cherry is a set of new hardware and ISA extensions that introduce um, some new um, features. I'm trying not to use the word capabilities here. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll go through them in the next uh, few slides, but we've been doing two um, kind of research investigations around Cherry. One of them is called Morello. Um, this is now quite public. Um, and uh, there's two links here if you're interested in more information. Morello experimentally extends the 64-bit ARM architecture with Cherry. Um, and the 64 arm architecture, as you probably know, is what's used in Cortex-A and Neoverse cores that are in, you know, a majority of mobile phones and, and, and quite a few infrastructure applications and so forth. Um, under the DARPA SIF program, we've also been looking at adapting Cherry to microcontroller applications um, for deeply embedded systems. And that's looking really promising. We haven't yet published anything on that work, but um, we are excited about the results we're seeing there as well. We think Cherry can drastically improve security for much of the software in today's systems and can span ISAs from the cores and microcontrollers to data centers. So we're excited about the potential here. There's still, you know, these are both still very squarely uh, in the research realm. Um, Morello is quite a bit further along um, and they're actually building an experimental test chip, um, which I believe will be available uh, around the end of this year, I believe. Um, and that's going to be made available to researchers and so forth. But these are these are still in the research kind of realm at the moment um, because Cherry is quite disruptive. So so what is this this kind of capability architecture? Um, so a capability is defined as an unforgeable to token of authority. 
kind of a bearer token. So possessing one is taken as authorization to use the resource it relates to. And Cherry applies this, you know, mature concept, the concept of capability has been around since I think the 1960s or so, and it applies it to memory. So pointers are replaced with capabilities and all access to memory goes through capabilities relating to each allocation of memory. And the capabilities uh, use a hardware tagging mechanism to, to achieve this unforgeable property that's a requirement. So there's a, a hardware memory tagging and provenance control mechanism to ensure capabilities can't be forged by, you know, for example, writing arbitrary bits to a, to a capability. If you do that without using the, the correct sort of provenance preserving instructions, then the hardware clears the tag and it's no longer a capability. Capabilities as well as the, the address, right? These are replacing pointers, as well as the address, they carry bounds and permissions with them and a kind of fat pointer, if you like. Um, and um, software basically shrinks and subdivides capabilities and hands out smaller allocations. So you can imagine, for example, malloc um, might be given at the start of the process a capability with a whole heap and it carves out and returns smaller capabilities for each allocation when it's called. And these features in Cherry, the, the bounds, the provenance control and a number of related features combine to address memory safety vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, those last two points just say what I said on the previous slide. So how do they work? I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail here in the interest of time, but just to kind of illustrate it really uh, quickly. Imagine you have this really horrendous function um, that you know takes in a username and uh, copies it into this fixed length buffer. Um, this, as everyone here probably knows, is a really bad idea, and um, it's pretty trivial for an attacker to exploit this by passing in a much longer, you know, strict copy um, looks for a null terminated string. And it'll just keep copying until it hits that null. So you you, you should really use something like extra in copy, um, which would um, you know stop copying once it hits the bound. But anyway, a lot of software looks like this, and this is kind of a canonical memory safety uh, bug or vulnerability. Um, by replacing the pointers here, like my array and username, with capabilities. Um, so this this grey sort of stack here is a is a representation of the stack. Um, the, the C ABI, as you probably know, puts typically puts the, the return address on the stack as well. So when you enter this function, um, you push the return address. And then when you get to here, the compiler allocates this my array on the stack. Um, and when you call strict copy, it gets appointed to here. Um, and if you pass in more than that 100 bytes, it'll keep growing up this way until it overwrites the return address. And once you overwrite the return address, you have uh, control, you can point it anywhere you want and, and start executing arbitrary code. Capabilities pre prevent this sort of attack in three ways. Firstly, the bounds prevent the overflow itself. Um, secondly, the, the provenance control I mentioned um, prevents, uh, allows you to detect that the return address has been corrupted and prevents you branching to it. And um, branching to data or the middle of functions is prevented because the wrong permissions would be set on the capability that uh, that would point into this area. And, you know, by itself, these protections don't stop all memory safety attacks, but they do go a long way to breaking exploit chains, which is how a majority of, of complex vulnerabilities are constructed these days, where it's not just one vulnerability, it's a whole series that are chained together. And you just have to break one link in that chain to break it. So capabilities are exciting and um, the work we're doing with Cherry is, is exciting and promising. And if you're interested in learning more about that, check out the Morello project. There's a bunch of open source resources available on that now. I think there's a public simulator and documentation and compilers and so forth. Um, and we hope that that technology, the Morello technology, you know, demonstrates enough value that it becomes part of the future um, mainline ARM CPUs. All right, so that was the first part. The second part, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna to have to speed up a bit. Second part is, is um, towards verifiably constant time crypto on ARM CPUs. So the starting posture here is the functional behavior of a CPU is well specified. We have this ARM um, ref reference manual, the architecture reference manual. It's quite a beast of a document. 
but it's it's fairly exhaustive and that defines the hardware software contract um, and if you look in it for each instruction you know in this case add with carry there's pseudocode that describes the operation uh, and this is a formal specification of the behavior of the processor the this language the unspecification language has um, formally defined semantics and um, you can kind of dig into exactly the operation that the instruction set architecture says the processor is performing here. Um, and you can interactively explore this. There's a few um, open source tools like ASL interpreter and the, um, all of the pseudocode here and all of the functions that are um, you know, called by them, that's all publicly released as part of the A profile exploration tools. Um, so you can download a, a big table of all the XML files and so forth. Um, and import them with MRA tools into ASLI and, and sort of interactively explore what the ISA is doing or claims to be doing. And this is part of a wider ecosystem. So a lot of this work was done by Alistair Reid, who used to be at ARM and ARM Research, he's now at Google. Um, and this was, um, there was a Paul Paul paper two years ago, uh, which I encourage you to read if you haven't already. Some more work around this is being done by Peter Searle's group at the University of Cambridge um, through their SAIL project. Um, and both the ARM architecture and the Morello architecture can be incorporated into the SAIL flow and, and using SAIL you can uh, convert that into a whole bunch of different forms. You can generate documentation, you can generate um, prover definitions, you can generate um, uh, simulators, you can generate tests, you can bring it into SMT. Uh, and, a, and a whole bunch of other things. So that's all great. Um, formal ISA specs and tooling let you ask and answer questions about what the instruction set architecture says it's supposed to be doing. And you can do all sorts of cool things with that. Um, but what about timing behavior? Because recall for crypto code, as we saw in earlier press talks, you actually need to care about the timing and the, the right way of doing crypto code is so-called constant time code. Now to write constant time code, you need to restrict yourself to instructions that um, have timing behavior that doesn't depend on the operand uh, values. So if you look at, um, let's say, uh, you know, signed divide instruction, run side divide, they have a latency that is dependent on the operand. So you shouldn't use these instructions in crypto code. Well, what about add and, and multiply, for example? Well, those look a bit better, um, but there's a but. Um, I'll come back to that. So th these are in what are called software optimization guides that um, publishes for each processor, for each of our different microarchitectures. Intel does the same. I believe other um, CPU vendors do the same. Um, I'm not proud to say, but I think Intel's documents do a much better job of get a, giving a disclaimer around these numbers. They say that the numbers in these tables are approximate and subject to change in future implementations in the microarchitecture. That there is a right, a big red flag, right? Because if you're relying on these numbers when you're writing crypto code, those are subject to change and it could go from constant time conceivably to non-constant time. Um, and that would make code that was safe now no longer safe on future hardware. Um, in this case, um, this was the, the data for, for an, uh, a Cortex A76, which is, um, you know, a typical, um, this would be a big processor and a big little cluster in a, in a mobile. Um, there's also little uh, cores in the clusters as well, maybe an, an A55. And in this case, this, um, this multiply instruction that was constant time on A76 actually has, um, a, a variable timing depending on the operand data. So if you're doing a 64-bit multiply um, where the top half, the top 32 bits um, are not all ones, then it will take three cycles. And if they are all ones, it will take two cycles. So there's data dependent timing behavior on, on this processor. Um, again, that's not ideal if you're writing crypto code. And as I said, these are often paired together in a big little cluster. Um, so if you're not familiar with this term, um, this is when you have uh, a heterogeneous collection of processes, typically just two, but perhaps that'll extend in the future, two different types of microarchitecture, high performance cores and, and sort of efficiency oriented cores. 
and the operating system will dynamically move tasks between these cores at runtime based on the needs of the system and some of that you know performance uh, management stuff thermals power etc um and user experience that that um i mentioned earlier and with increased pressure to deliver performance and in, uh, in, in the face of end of moors um this sort of thing is only going to get worse so um you know it, it's conceivable future uh systems may have more than just two types of microarchitecture. it's conceivable and likely that you'll see the operating system moving tasks around um, more often and in more cases. And if you're relying on this timing behavior we talked about here, that's a problem because when you're running here, your constant time and when you get migrated here without anyone telling you because the operating system decided you didn't need a high performance core, then you're no longer constant time. And so what's really going on here? Well, the architecture defines what happens in terms of the functional behavior. Um, but it says basically nothing about timing behavior. And this is by design. Um, this is because architectures want long-term software capability, uh, compatibility. So they want software written today to work on a process of 10 or 20 years from now. And, you know, as, as architects, you know, you naturally aspire to clean orthogonal abstractions. Um, but Below the level of the ISA, microarchitects need freedom to innovate within the envelope of permitted behavior. So the ISA defines an envelope of behavior, and the microarchitecture is the specific instantiation on a of you know of a CPU on a, on a particular chip. And microarchitects can and do wild things to get better performance. And um, if you were surprised in early 2018 when Spectre came out that you know, a CPU could do all of those things that it does in terms of speculative behavior and so forth. Um, then this is an example of some of the things that that microarchitects do to to get better performance. Um, by and large, the operating system and the and and most of the software only concerns itself with architected behavior. And um, in principle, um, because the functional behavior of these two multiply instructions was the same. The operating system is free to move your process from one to the other. In um, the 8.4, I think it was, we added um, a bit to the P state, which is the, the um, one of the a system register for processor state. And it basically allows software to query um, whether or not the hardware has data independent timing support. So there's a, as, as in the, in, as defined in the arm arm, there's there's a set of instructions that are um, said to have um, uh, timing behavior that does not depend on the operands or the flags or certain other things when this uh, data independent timing bit is set. So if you're writing crypto code and you're relying on the timing behavior of, of uh, instructions, this is something you should be looking into. Um, and you know this is this is low hanging fruit in a way. This is you know most of these instructions like add and 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 boolean operations and so forth are ones where most sane hardware would implement in a constant time way anyway. But again, it's about the contract between hardware and software and ensuring that the assumptions that you're making in your software are, uh, valid assumptions that will still be valid on future CPUs 10 or 20 years from now, because we know software has a habit of sticking around uh, for a long time, right? So I think as we've seen in some of the other talks, um, writing constant time code can have a large performance impact compared to unsafe code. Um, some examples, you know, that people do in their constant time code when they're in crypto is, you know, they might emulate floating point using bitwise operations and so forth because the hardware doesn't typically implement floating point instructions in a constant time way, especially for things like denormals and so forth. Um, and more generally, if you if you really if you really care about constant time, you can do things like transforming code into circuits and bit slicing and so forth. Um, this data independent timing bit we added is just a sort of low hanging fruit, a first step, and um, I, I've kind of listed some questions to the community, right, for the, for the secure compilation community. How would you like this to look? How would you like this to evolve? Um, what kind of invariants and guarantees would you like CPUs to be able to make? Um, right, with, with uh, 
with with the data independent timing, we don't guarantee that these instructions are constant time. We just guarantee that their timing doesn't be, doesn't depend on the operands or the flags or certain other things. Um, and that we think is a useful abstraction for for reasoning about and writing this sort of software. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other questions, and we'd love to um, hear from the community on some of those. All right, the the last part I wanted to talk about is confidential compute. Um, and I see I'm doing even worse on time now, so I'm going to have to speed up. I think I might actually just skip this bit on FHA. Um, we can come back to it, perhaps, in the questions. Um, OK. So I, I talked earlier about confidential compute and cryptographic approaches and trusted hardware. We're interested in both of these. Um, we're, we're just about to start a um, a, pro a project under the DARPA Deprive um, program with a number of collaborators looking at hardware accelerating these sort of things. Um, but the focus really has been on trusted hardware and I wanted to dig a little bit into some of the things we're doing there. So we have a project in ARM research called Veracruz, which is about doing private delegated compute, um, like I talked about earlier. So this is kind of the software infrastructure you need for, for doing these sort of workloads and applications. Um, on uh, a variety of currently available um, trust execution environments, including Trust Zone and Intel SGX. Um, Veracruz is, um, ha has a number of, of kind of components. So um, first off, there's a sandbox where programs run um, inside the enclave. Um, and the sandbox is implemented using WebAssembly as the sandbox. So programs are brought into the enclave as WebAssembly programs and a WebAssembly runtime is used to, to sandbox these, these uh, functions that you want to apply to, uh, to confidential data. Um, Veracruz also has uh, infrastructure for performing attestation of the state of the TE, um, measuring its contents and, and uh, conveying those measurements to the relying parties. Um, and it, it has a sort of a policy framework for allowing data owners and program owners to specify how their data and programs should be used, um, permissions, identities, that sort of thing, what should happen to the output. Um, so the space we're sort of living in with Veracruz is we want to have a framework for efficient multi-party computations in the same kind of vein as things like uh, FHE that I, that I talked about. Um, but we aim to be efficient, so fast enough to execute real interesting programs, familiar, so programmers can use tools they're familiar with, general, so they're not limited in the computation model, uh, and reusable, um, so that um, uh, library functionality and so forth can exist without everything having to be done from, from scratch every time each time um, and we, we aim to do all of that while still delivering similar security and privacy guarantees to what you get with these cryptographic approaches subject to the the hardware trust thing that I mentioned earlier so we have an abstraction over isolates um, and we currently support three um, we have a, an ARM trust zone based um, TA isolate we have Intel SGX enclaves and we have an implementation of SEL4 on uh, AH64 as a micro hypervisor um, that can be used to create isolates as well. And these kind of exist on a continuum of paranoia, if you like. Um, credit to my colleague Dominic Mulligan for coming up with this phrase I really like. Um, uh, from, from the kind of really paranoid, where you really, you know, arguably really only have to trust the CPU itself. Uh, in the case of SGX, just the actual chip itself, um, that, that implements a whole bunch of mechanisms like memory encryption and, and integrity protection and stuff to, to try and make that possible through to maybe slightly less paranoid cases like um, you know, software isolation using a formally verified um, microkernel with um, fairly rigorous security and integrity properties. And we abstract over these and add a programming model based on WebAssembly and a station mechanism based on ARM's PSA, that's the Platform Security Architecture Protocol. Um, there's a bunch of things that we're currently working on and thinking about. Um, so in the vein of kind of secure comp uh, compilation, we want to go further with WebAssembly. We think WebAssembly is really interesting as a, 
um, as a kind of um, intermediate representation for skewer compilation because um, we one of the goals with a confidential computing environment normally is to minimize the amount of stuff in the trusted computing base. So having a compiler, for example, and all of the software that, that supports that within the within the enclave is you know, somewhat risky because that's a large volume of software that could potentially have vulnerabilities in it that an attacker could exploit. Um, we want to minimize the amount of stuff in the TCB, um, but we don't want to necessarily just allow arbitrary machine code binaries to be run inside the enclave because that would, you know, uh, in the absence of other sandboxing mechanisms, that would um, uh, create a risk of a, a maliciously crafted binary um, potentially um, compromising the other contents of the enclave. Um, so we're interested in, in exploring other ways of doing sandboxing, for example, with Morello, um, when that hardware starts to become available. Um, we're interested in how you can deploy, uh, deploy sort of microarchitecture specific mitigations for things like specter variants and so forth without having to recompile from source to WASM. So by changing the way that we generate the machine code from WASM uh, or the way that we interpret that WASM, um, uh, we hope to be able to deploy uh, mitigations um, without having to have the software author go back and recompile their source level program. Um, there's a bunch of other things that, that we're working on there as well, but I think I'll skip forward in the interest of time. Um, so Veracruz is open source, it's on GitHub. Um, we've only been there for a couple of months and uh, um, we're excited to be doing this research in the open after you know being in, in, in secret and in, in, um, secret labs for a long time. Um, and we're excited to um, to have submitted CCC uh, submitted Veracruz as a CCC project to the to the Confidential Computing Consortium, um, and that's I believe been accepted. Although I think there's a little bit more paperwork to be do, to be done there. Um, okay, looking forward to the future. You know, I see secure compilation as a vital technology. I'm looking forward to a future where programmers can capture security intent directly alongside their high-level programs in a high-level programming language, um, where hardware can export specifications describing the security features it has, the microarchitectural side channel behavior it has, and so forth, where owners of data can determine and define policies limiting and specifying how their data is used and shared, and um, where next generation secure compilation technology can pull all that together, those policies, the specs and the programs and automatically gener generate verifiably correct, secure and performant binaries. Now, I think we have a long way to go on all fronts. I, uh, I hope you agree with me. And if not, I'd love to hear why, why this future is closer than I think, but I'm really excited to, to work towards this, this goal. I think this is uh, an incredibly, um, uh, incredibly exciting and, and high potential area and uh, looking forward to hearing um, the rest of the talks this afternoon at Prisk. Thank you very much.